Uh, perhaps we could begin now. No one would actually enter into the betting contest with me, but I had assumed that this would be virtually unattended. E <laughs> economics at quarter of two in the afternoon, and I'm pleasantly surprised. It's also occurring to me as the conference takes shape that when I teach German unification, there's three narratives that they're related, but are often narrated separately, given primal cause. There's a narrative of foreign policy, there's a narrative of economic decline, indeed collapse, and there is a narrative of the internal political situation, the GDR. And in some ways, we're mirroring this fragmented uh, uh, approach to German history, although connections are already beginning to be drawn. Uh, welcome to the second panel on the political economy of unification, then. And we have uh, uh, two speakers who will, for about 10 minutes each, actually I'm giving them 15 minutes each, special dispensation, uh, uh, summarize their papers and uh, talk a bit about uh, the main theses, and then a comment by Wolfgang Zeibel. I'll introduce them before they begin speaking. Uh, the first is Jonathan Zatlin, Associate Professor of History at Boston University, and the title of his paper, available on our website, is Reconsidering Reunification, German Monetary Union and Its European Consequences. Thank you. So uh, first I'd like to thank the Baker Institute as well as Carl for inviting me. And then I'd like to apologize. I'm one of these people who actually did get the swine flu about two weeks ago. Uh, I'm not feeling piggy anymore. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, I have a bad cough. It's an asthmatic they liken it, the respiratory problems to, to basically asthma. So I hope I won't hack and cough uh, through everything. But this is one of those legacies moment. Uh, and my paper really is about the legacy of German unification. And in particular, what I look at isn't unification itself. And it's not the uh, foreign political aspects of unification. It's the mechanism by which Germany was unified, which was really German monetary union. Uh, this is how coal achieves both the political, domestic political in East Germany as well as in West Germany, the ability uh, to unify the country, the institutional transfers uh, on the one hand, and also the sorts of foreign political arguments about the inevitability of unification. Um, so being a historian, uh, long wind up, I talk a little bit about, in, in the paper, about the East German situation and how chaotic uh, it, it, both on the economic and the political side, it, it was, both in the run-up to the fall of the wall as well as right afterwards. Because uh, not only could people uh, actually go to visit in these day trips, go to Ber West Berlin as well as West Germany, uh, but a lot of people began to move to uh, West Germany, primarily because of the concerns that people had about the current uh, the, the, the then government of the GDR, which was still in communist hands, and which had a somewhat conflicted, let's say, uh, sense of liberalization, uh, but also because the economy seemed at the time to be crumbling very quickly. And this problem of labor mobility, the idea that since you could have West German citizenship recognized immediately, um, there was no linguistic barrier, and now there was no wall, you could really go. Um, this weakened the the prospects of any kind of East German uh, political solution as well as a stabilization of the economy uh, and created a kind of vicious uh, circle. Certain sectors of the economy were hit harder than others. Uh, and as people perceived other people leaving, of course, the, the draw became greater. So this becomes a, an important political as well as an economic moment. The question was what to do. And as I try and point out in the paper, um, I think one of the things that we all forget is, at least in the domestic sphere, that Cole, on the 6th of February, 1990, makes an offer to the East German populace of giving them the West German mark. He styles it as a completion, if you like, of the currency reform of 1948, moving the, the West German mark eastwards. Um, this offer was a, a matter of political brilliance. I mean, this is a man who actually hadn't shown a, a large degree of boldness, had been criticized for being cautious. The 10-point program that was discussed last night and again this morning was perceived as not particularly impressive. And in terms of the revolutionary dynamic in East Berlin and in other parts of East Germany, it lagged behind because people were already talking about both German unification in East Germany and were beginning to talk about having the mark, which was the sign not just of, of West German prosperity but of political institutions that had created it. Um, so he, he really seized the initiative 
here. And he undercut not only the communist gov government under Modro, uh, but the civil rights activists as well, uh, who were, I think, out of touch with the East German population. He also, uh, by doing that, domesticated the revolution. And he put it on a path uh, towards unification. He, he took the East German Revolution and transformed it into a kind of moment of stability. The notion was that if you offer the, the Demok, there's a reason for all of the East Germans to stay because eventually they're going to have not just the Demok, but unification itself, all of the politi political and social uh, institutions that may, made the, the uh, West Germany what they thought it was, for uh, ill or for, for better. Um, so. This, I think, was, from a political perspective, absolutely brilliant. Undercut almost all of his political foes and also rehabilitated, almost in one fell swoop, the East German CDU, as I'm sure Marcos Meckler will, can tell us. Uh, I mean, I remember going in sometime in the beginning of March uh, 1990, and people still thought that the SPD was going to win the election. Uh, but nevertheless, there was this incredible moment where the SPD, which unfortunately is empirically wrong. The SPD had come out, was one of the first political organizations to come out in the East for some kind of, of monetary union. But because Cole was the one to offer it, the East German CDU got these political benefits, which helped it win the elections, the parliamentary elections of 18th March. So thinking about this, which really did change the entire constellation domestically in both Germanys, and I would argue, uh, was an important, more important factor than I think has been discussed when it came to the two plus four negotiations and, and, and um, even earlier than that, um, that although it was politically brilliant, of course, there's a collision between politics and political edu 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 oh, I can't even talk now, um, <clears throat> exigency uh, on the one hand and economic expertise on the other because both professional economists as well as a lot of businessmen and industrialists uh, and bankers were against this. Not only that, but it flew in the face of 30 years' worth of German policy on what a monetary union should be and when it should take place. For 30 years, the objection of the German government as well as the Bundesbank to any kind of European common currency was that first you had to have the correct political and economic convergence among member states and that the actual money part of it would finalize the whole process, which was referred to as the coronation theory. So here Cole is saying, look, let's not coronate this process between East and West Germany. Let's go ahead and use money to make it happen. And although that in itself, I think, is a fascinating process, it created some institutional tensions with the Bundesbank, which I think, if you read the literature, most people end up basically saying, well, it didn't really matter uh, because in the end, we get a European Central Bank, and what do we care about the Bundesbank anymore? Or they say something like, well, there wasn't any choice. Politics needed to take precedence over economics. Or they say some version of, well, we want Germany to be unified. This is the only way. It's a short term. It's a little window that's closing. So you've got to do something. And while I don't disagree with that, uh, what I'm interested in are these unintended consequences. You have trade-offs between economics and politics. I would argue, actually, that you can't disentangle the two. Um, but in making this kind of a decision, there are all sorts of unintended consequences that come out of it. So uh, when you think about monetary union, uh, the, the, the trade-offs here are that it did stop this labor mobility, this exodus of East Germans moving from the East to the West. Like I said, it stabilized the situation in East Germany and made possible process, a clear process of unification. Uh, the problem is that it was only a kind of formal political unification. It was not an economic integration. That was the major trade-off. Not only that, but uh, it created all kinds of institutional tensions with the Bundesbank. The biggest moment, <coughs> I would argue there, uh, the one that is for our purposes uh, today most important, is that the Bundesbank was put in a difficult position where it had to fight the inflationary impact of all of the decisions that the coal government made in the monetary sphere. And because it had to do that at home and preserve price stability, it had to relinquish its position in the European monetary system as the leader. This was a time at which there was an economic contraction in Europe, so people were lowering interest rates. And all of these currencies uh, in the core of Europe were pegged to the Demark. By ratcheting up interest rates, 
first the Finnish marca, uh, and then the Italian lira, and then the British pound, and we can go on, all had to basically quit the European monetary system. So one of the consequences of uh, German unification, German monetary union in particular, is the destruction of the European monetary system. And this contradicts, of course, one of the, the important moments about when you think about the uh, foreign political situation, that there was supposedly a quid, quo, uh, quid pro quo where if the French and the British were to accept German unification, that the Germans would then give up the mark. This would be one of the, th the things that they would do for Europe. Uh, well, the Maastricht Treaty is put together, and it's also ratified in early 1992. Uh, within the space of about nine months, Black Wednesday happens, um, and that's the end of the European monetary system. And it seemed at the time, through 1993, that there wasn't going to be a common currency, because Maastricht itself, the treaty, uh, is rather vague. It does provide for all sorts of institutions, but it didn't set a timetable, and it was very vague about how those institutions should be uh, uh, set up. And my argument is that 1992-1993, the, the, uh, the destruction of the EMS, uh, is a direct consequence of German monetary union. But ironically, it's the thing that speeds up, accelerates, and makes possible the euro. Uh, and that part of what's going on here isn't just this notion of a quid pro quo. If you let us unify, therefore we'll give up the currency. It's also this argument that if you throw the coronation theory overboard and say that it is possible, in fact, to start with a currency and then have economically disparate regions united. If you fly in the face of economic theory, look, we've done it in Germany. You, the German government, as well as the Bundesbank, can no longer say that it's impossible, that there's, they've lost a, an important argument, uh, and that European monetary union not only ha has to happen because there are no arguments against it, but because of the currency volatility itself the disparity between the role of the Bundesbank at home and its role inside of Europe, that it makes it more likely, in fact, in, if you look at the domestic uh, situation in West Germany in particular, West German industry, West German bankers, uh, this whole problem of 92-93 leads many people to conclude that you can't have this kind of currency volatility. You've got to do something. You've got to create a, a common uh, currency. So in this very ironic and very nonlinear way, uh, I would argue that German monetary union leads us to the single currency, the euro. Thank you. Our next presenter today is Erwin Collier, a professor of economics at the Free University in Berlin. His paper is entitled A Splendid Failure, Reflections on Two Decades of East German Economic Reconstruction. Also, thank you, Carl, for the invitation to come back to Houston. Uh, I spent 14 very happy years in this city. It's always great to come back. I'd like to pick up one point that was made this morning. Uh, I completely agree with the use of the word German unification when we're talking about the political events of 1990. Uh, I think in the case of political unification, German policymakers were dealt a good hand, and I think they played it brilliantly. Economically, Aufbau Ost, or what I'll call East German Reconstruction, was the consequence. This was putting uh, uh, economic life into the words, the, the, the desires, the hopes of Willy Brandt, the growing together of what belongs together. I've chosen the word reconstruction deliberately rather than the word unification or integration uh, because I see a striking parallel to the history of the United States and in particular the history of the United States South. But I won't belabor the analogy. Four decades of centrally planned socialism turned out to be a self-inflicted scorched earth economic policy. Now after two decades down the historical road, uh, we find ourselves with more elected representatives. Uh, this is from the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Two decades uh, down the road, we find more elected representatives in the Bundespunk, uh, Bund uh, Bundestag with a known Stasi skeleton in the closet than there are members of the civic avant-garde. And that's even giving Chancellor Merkel a triple uh, weight in the count. Uh, these are signs that things are not going as one thought 
earlier. Uh, what is success? What is failure? Essentially, success is a sustainable growth in the sense that uh, what is produced on the territory of the new federal states is more or less in balance with the spending uh, that takes place there. Uh, thinking <laughs> about East German Reconstruction, uh, I recall the lecture I had many years ago as a student in, America, in an American history class where W.E.B. Uh, e. Du Bois was uh, quoted in his history, 1935 history of black reconstruction where he referred to black reconstruction as a splendid failure. One of the, those, those expressions that comes up and probably haunts Helmut Kohl, if anything would haunt them, the promise of blooming uh, landscapes that he did not use the moment to take a Churchillian uh, pose and promise people toils and sweat, knowing that by the grace of God the German people were avoided the blood and tears that Churchill offered uh, his own people. Anyway, this idea of blooming landscapes on the territory of the new states, uh, how do you interpret that? At best, I would say it's foolish. Um, the worst interpretation is it was just a, a cynical bait and switch <coughs> tactic to win an election. I really think that's wrong. I, I, I think either interpretation, that Helmut Kohl didn't know what he was saying and that it was just a cynical election ploy, I, I think what we have here, my interpretation, is something that makes Obama so pow powerful, his words, that this ability to strike a common chord that resonates among the population. The German economic miracle happened before. Why can't it happen again? Where do we know anything about such prospects of rebuilding? Well, the German economic miracle had three clear lessons. Hard money was at the center of getting things up and running again. The so-called ordo-liberal school's emphasis on having clear rules of property and contract to let markets determine price, let consumers and businesses decide what to produce and or buy, and trust the combination of individual enterprise and the discipline of markets to get a socially acceptable outcome. And then to the extent this is not possible because of extraordinary circumstances, such as the mass migration of the expelled populations from the former eastern territories of, uh, 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 of Germany. There was the third lesson, <coughs> call it the soft hearts, burden sharing. That was also very much part of the ideology, if you will, or the experience when Germans say social market economy, those are basically the three things that should go off. You think of them, hard money, clear rules of property, uh, uh, and contract, and the soft hearts. Why, that is just the monetary, economic, and social union. So anyway, I think the kind of forecast, the gut forecast that was shared across the population was we're going, we have the possibility to see a repeat of German post-war history. Okay, so that's what the unwashed, the uneducated economists thought. Let's take a look at what my colleagues thought. Don't worry, this will be the only slide. Uh, otherwise, it, you know, but, it, but, but it'll be a, a short dog and pony show. Okay, what we want to look at as the measure of the success of economic reconstruction is how real <laughs> output per person in the two Germanys come together over time. The red is going to always denote history. So 1991, we see East Germany's per capita output at 43% of West Germany's. Now, let's think of the first round of predictions Okay, 100 here, you could say, is 
not really at 100 is where the, the blooming landscapes start. I would say around 90, you could say, we, you know, that's plenty of enough blooms for everybody to go around. Very optimistic. About a year later, we get this sort of, and if you look down, downstairs, is when economists stuck their neck outs and put a number and a date, we have uh, a variety. I have a handout that I can uh, give you with the exact <coughs> names. You know, this sort of thing is really boring if you don't at least name names. <laughs> and then the last group out here. Well, let's kind of see a, a useful way of looking at this. Let's make some assumptions about possible different growth rates for the East German economy. If per capita GDP were growing at 9% in East Germany, compared to a trend rate of growth of a little less than 2% in West Germany, that is the path we should have observed. An 8%, since it's not growing as fast, and what you can do is you then would go down and see, aha, the blooming landscapes would have been around by 2006. Well, we can play this game going a little bit farther. 2009 had the East German economy been growing at 7% per capita. If it was a 6% growth per capita, this convergence, full convergence, would, have occurred in, would occur in 2012. Okay. 5% coming out, and then you have that number way out there, number eight, just to give you sort of a, an idea to mention names. A professor at Harvard, Robert Barrows, is someone who's been comparing growth experiences across uh, the world and through human history. So he looks at instances such as reconstruction in the South. How long did it take backward Southern economy to start looking like Houston, Texas? Okay, that you would have some Houston, Texas. So uh, it takes a long time. So that's why he had a particularly pessimistic. Um, for full disclosure, uh, if you put around uh, uh, 2005 at 75%, so about on the 6% growth path, that's where I once in print uh, uh, put what I expected. So anyway, how, do, how did history react? That's what was going on in the minds of economists. Oh, there's the 3%. OK, it's at 73%. Interesting enough, going up to the middle of the 1990s, uh, blooming landscapes uh, uh, didn't seem like such a crazy idea at all. We see a significant structural break for the next 10 years. Things getting a little bit better. And it's hard for me to figure whether things with a given downturn, you figure the West German economy exports more than the East German economy. There's no reason for that, for the East German relative performance to look different. My question is how to account for the deviation from the fast track to the blooming landscapes. One line of argument, and I refer you to the excellent book recently published by Karl Heinz Paquet, Die Bilanz, The Bottom Line, an economic analysis of German uh, unification. Uh, took the position, took the line, the fast track was really never an option. That a myth, a false belief at the time, was that German, East German economic reconstruction would be like putting new spark plugs in an old car, and suddenly you have a car that is working, the motor would be humming again. <coughs> this misses the fact that for four decades, the GDR economy was in an economic backwaters. The very products that evolved were definitely not what the global market ordered. And when saleable, they were only saleable at a steep price discount that would imply very low real wages in an economy producing that assortment of goods that had gone so far away from 
consumer and producer preferences. In the classic paper of 1991 by Akerlof, Yellen, Rose, and Cassensius, that they calculated only about one-fifth of East German industrial firms would have been able to cover even their variable costs of production. So that's the sort of the running, just keeping things running. The fixed costs, uh, they couldn't cover in any event. But one-fifth, only one-fifth could cover the variable costs, which is the difference between shutting down to, max, max, uh, to minimize your losses, uh, a, a, a very important threshold. Um, and they came to this conclusion looking at the secret uh, foreign exchange coefficients of the GDR foreign trade agency. The fact was it costs on average for the East German economy about four East marks to earn one D mark. Okay, at the time this was a, considered a kind of knockout punch argument that the initial one-to-one -one exchange rate uh, for the East mark uh, 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 was really damaging. Uh, but as the argument goes, you know, that was a one-time adjustment. We knew there would be new adjustments uh, coming along. Uh, anyone producing for global markets uh, uh, and, and, and paying domestic prices would uh, uh, end up finding their costs getting bid up over time anymore. In any event, transfers either in the form of subsidies to keep the businesses afloat or to pay for unemployment benefits uh, uh, was going to be the result. So the issue, you know, could these old dogs learn new tricks, the existing East German enterprises, or did it require new firms producing new goods? Well, we think when the first head of the Toyhand Anstalt, the trustee agency for East German uh, property, uh, the belief was the German government or the East German citizenry would have 600 billion D marks of revenue after costs, so net after the sale. Well, it turned out that this figure was actually a 200 billion D mark loss. They missed it by 800 billion uh, D marks. <laughs> Okay, so we just call that, uh, and I'll uh, try to uh, speed up, uh, the fallacy, of, uh, the spark plug fallacy, or to use the words of one of my favorite Texas politicians, or my favorite words of a former Texas governor, uh, the, the lipstick on a pig fallacy. The second fallacy was the ex is an expectation that fits in with the lipstick on a pig fallacy. We can call that of homogeneity that even though we are aware of enormous diversity of economic circumstances in, in human affairs, um, it's sort of easy to forget that averages uh, or stereotypes are only useful as uh, uh, shortcuts. We all know what we mean by Ossi and Vesi, but of course, the reality is much richer. Same kind of mistake is made. One thought of closing this gap is going to be something that is uniform, all ships rising, which is a metaphor that we often use during business cycles. When you try to improve the business uh, uh, conditions, all firms are going to profit. That instead, economic growth is uh, uh, sort of the difference between two different flows. It's sort of like the way populations evolve. You have births and deaths. When the births are bigger than the deaths, the population grows. Similarly, uh, 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 you'll have entrepreneurial births and creative destruction a la Schumpeter deaths will be the story of what is happening. My point? Convergence would be a question of structural change moving away from old industries, moving into new industries, moving into new industries requires uh, a, a different kind of investment, a different kind of spirit, and on top of that, when we see structural change, there's often a regional uh, a dimension to it. That if you look at the economic history of the United States, you see cities rise and fall. Think of Flint, Michigan. You see them rise, fall, and rise. Think of Pittsburgh. For the new uh, 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 states of Germany, these sort of clusters, agglomerations, the location of economic activity along the autobahns uh, uh, is the way we're going to observe 
this sort of uh, convergence. So what? The idea of just generally subsidizing investment across the board was uh, one of these fallacies of putting in the infrastructure uh, uh, across all of East Germany meant that they were building a lot of bicycle paths to nowhere, that you needed to concentrate in uh, uh, fewer areas rather than spreading the infrastructure investment uh, uh, across the, uh, uh, the country. Third misperception, and this is where uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop uh, picking up what we've just been talking about. Helmut Kohl often said that German unification and European unification were two sides of the same coin. Uh, it is a subtle irony of speech, I find, uh, that one uses a metaphor uh, uh, involving money here. This is a claim uh, that echoes the fa famous Thatcherism, there is no alternative. However, not being capable of seeing an alternative is not the same thing as there not being an alternative. So everyone will tell you it was a necessary cost of German unification to pursue uh, the European dimension, the deepening of, uh, 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 of European connections to keep everybody satisfied. But I don't think anyone was at all aware of what this implied. What it implied were two things for East German uh, uh, reconstruction. The first, uh, uh, think of the criteria for the Ma Maastricht uh, Treaty and for the introduction of the Euro. It involved across all of Europe a tightening of fiscal and monetary policies. So what? The, the importance of this was that this economic reconstruction required a dramatic flow of, in, uh, of investment into the new states. This would only occur if the rest of Europe was really at full capacity. Only then does it become interesting? Only then would a location like the new federal states of Germany come into this competition for the new location of economic activity. So one of the consequences of signing off on uh, 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 the Maastricht criteria and joining this collective slowdown in the European economies that we, I think, see here uh, uh, being reflected uh, in, the, in the slowdown uh, uh, in convergence. The second and the last point has to do with the necessity for investment. Uh, uh, state aid still can play a productive role. That European harmonization was such as to prohibit, uh, uh, have a general prohibition on <coughs> state aid for investment. Now there was a loophole that Germany was able to exploit for the uh, uh, support of investments for regions that had disadvantages due to the division of Europe. Hans Dietrich Genscher apparently believed that this included the, uh, uh, the aftershocks from real existing socialism so that assistance to industries located in the new states was a legitimate use of state aid. This was not the view of the European partners. And what I found very interesting when you follow the debate that happened was it took a minister president from one of the Länder, uh, Kurt Biedenkopf of Saxony, to actually go to bat for the, uh, 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 for the interests of the new federal state. So let me just leave it there that uh, there were three major perceptions that I think unnecessarily slowed down the East German reconstruction process. Now to provide comment, we have uh, Professor Wolfgang Seibel, Professor of Politics and Public Administration at the University of Constance. Thank you very much for, for having the possibility to take part in this, this panel, especially since I'm neither an economist nor an economic historian. So. Uh, the uh, lack of, of knowledge in, in uh, f uh, economic affairs 
could be something I have in common with those in charge. Uh, 89 to 1990, it just sprung to my mind when I was, was hearing, especially Irving Collier's uh, uh, presentation. Well, I um, do think, as a commentator, um, that uh, the papers have, have something in, in common. So both uh, papers are highlighting the amazing uh, impact of legends and myths in a realm which otherwise is, is being considered as being subject to mere facts and, and sober calculation. So the question, uh, one of the questions one, one, one should uh, discuss is, well, how, uh, how come those, those legends and, and, and myths is, is, is a very unlikely an assumption or unlikely a, a, a phenomenon that those people were just dumb, that they were, were not smart enough to, to organize the whole process, and uh, that is why all those misperceptions came about. And would they, would they have had read Schumpeter, for example, more... Or, well, profoundly, they would have avoided all those mistakes. This is not a very realistic assumption, I guess. And you saw also in those papers, well, different, uh, significantly different approaches. One was the, the economic approach, and the other one was the typical approach by an economic historian, uh, which uh, the historian always still tries, tries to do what Ranke recommended, to reconstruct, well, how it actually happened. And uh, the, so uh, you have a normative perspective, which is uh, the, the economic perspective, how things should have happened, and you have the perspective of an economic historian who describes at least a large part of the paper is devoted to the question, well, how did it actually happen, which is of pivotal importance, and I will spell it out a little bit more. If we uh, think of the question, well, how came that that uh, coal made this decision February the 6th to, to declare, that was precisely what he said, to declare the readiness of the West German federal government to negotiate with the East German government about a currency union. And indeed, and that is nicely described in, in Jonathan's uh, paper, uh, he, he, he tossed all the philosophy and, and, and the principles the German, West German government had been heralded so far, which was, was uh, uh, enshrined in the so-called coronation theory that a currency union uh, would, could be the result or the final outcome of our economic coherence between not only the two German states in question, but in general of any uh, common currency in, uh, in the future of European, what then was the uh, European community. And so suddenly, uh, Kohl himself said uh, that, well, we don't take that into account anymore. What counts more is uh, that we um, take immediate steps forward to uh, such a currency union, regardless of anything what will happen in terms of economic reform in East Germany. So that was a message. Uh, I don't think that that was blundering. Uh, I don't think that was uh, just illusionary. Uh, Kohl had very good reasons for that, and what one has to take into account is precisely what we heard yesterday night and uh, also in part this morning. A very strong role uh, played the geopolitical embeddedness of the whole process. Because what did the currency union do, or what did already the prospects of a currency union do? It gave a perspective of stability and prosperity, at least theoretically, to the East Germans, and it gave the prospect, the, the, the prospect of well, West Germany as a stable democracy taking responsibility for the fate of entire Germany, including the fiscal risks that were involved in that scenery. So, and that was very important because, as we know from the documents and as we, as we heard yesterday, the concern of not only Maggie Thatcher but uh, also of François Mitterrand and uh, George Herbert Walker Bush was that, in fact, the collapse of an empire, and that was ultimately what happened. The collapse of an empire was a very, very dangerous situation. And the or, well, situation in East Germany, immediately at the interface of what used to be the Cold War system, was of pivotal importance by obvious reasons. 
and having observed the collapse of other communist regimes already in early 1990, the whole scenery was one characterized by instability and, well, certainly a situation which was, uh, well, implying serious, very serious risks of international well, tensions, maybe conflicts and open violence, not only domestically, but maybe also uh, internationally. And so that was uh, undoubtedly this one of the well, scenarios which was on the radar screen on the on the perception uh, patterns and the mindsets of the strategic actors in charge. So what did the currency union do in that situation? It gave uh, the uh, well, prospects, as I said, of stability and it sent the message also to German, West Germany's Western allies that the West German government was ready to take charge of the situation and it had an immediate mitigating effect on the outmigration of, of East Germans who then had the, the hope or the, the concrete perspective of being part of, well, let's say, West German prosperity, maybe even wealth, or the success story uh, which was circumscribed in the very myth of the Währungsunion, of the Währungsreform of June 1948, and that was precisely why that rhetoric and language was used by Kohl and others and the governing coalition in Bonn at that time. So there were much more serious reasons involved in um, the way to, well, a currency union, which had that absolutely disastrous effect once it was uh, implemented by on July 1st, 1990, and those disastrous effects could be spelled out in detail. That is not my task in this very moment, I guess. There was another aspect in talking about, well, how could it happen, or what uh, needs one to take into account in terms of, of mere empirical historical facts. The uh, main uh, economic effect of the currency union was not the union, the currency union as such. It was, of course, the conversion rate. And the conversion rate uh, was uh, mainly, well, accordance, uh, in accordance with, with economic textbooks, was, was dependent on labor productivity. And labor productivity, labor productivity in East Germany at that time was uh, around 30-35% of what it was in, in West Germany. So a conversion rate of 1 to 3 would have been in principle appropriate and, and, and uh, Jonathan in his paper describes uh, that that was in, indeed uh, what was envisaged relatively early already in December 1989. And Jonathan also describes in his paper uh, the uh, debates and the internal conflicts, especially the conflicts between the Bundesbank and Kohl himself, uh, about this very conversion rate. So what the conversion rate did when it was finally uh, implemented on the basis of 1 to 1 uh, July the 1st, 1990, was that it made overnight or almost any German firm unprofitable uh, because uh, the, the products uh, based on the outmoded uh, capital stock could not be sold on, 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 uh, on a competitive market uh, at uh, cost-covering prices, and that destroyed the basis of a healthy economy overnight, as I said. So, of course, one knew that. Of course, that was predictable. The question is, well, why are people doing such insane things? The answer is, it was not insane. It was not insane because otherwise the government of the uh, GDR and probably also the West German government would have found themselves in deep trouble. Why? Because it was in early April 1990 that for the first time after the fall of 1989, uh, 1989 uh, people in East Germany flocked to the streets and organized huge demonstrations in favor of what? In favor of a one-to-one -one conversion rate. Because they said with rather good reasons, well, after all, that is what was promised, what had been promised by Kohl in terms of those blooming landscapes, and that is what we justifiably may expect after having borne the costs of the lost war for 40 years, we want our share of the pie. And 
having the perspective of well having the Denmark in our hands in terms of salary, but cut down to 30 percent or 35 percent what it used to be under the DDR mark uh, regime is just not acceptable, especially not when uh, it can be expected that there will be rising prices for everything, including rents and tra public transportation and so on and so forth, the uh, decline of public subsidies for food stuff and uh, all those things. So that was a completely reasonable perspective. And we do know that also well, members of the West German federal government were exerting heavy pressure on coal, especially Norbert Blum, the uh, Minister for Labour and Social Affairs, not to uh, consent with the Bundesbank and uh, uh, accepting a conversion rate of, of one to two, for example, for, for wages and, and salaries, because that would put heavy strain on the social insurance system and the social welfare system in West Germany. And just uh, the, the German welfare state could not afford that. He discarded absolutely, uh, maybe significantly enough for him, the uh, consequences of the or conversion rate one to one, which was that, well, nonetheless, the social welfare system in West Germany uh, was to be held accountable for the social consequences of mass unemployment, which was precisely what happened. What happened, but still, that was the situation in early April when coal, and the final decision was taken, as far as I recall, from Jonathan's paper, April the twenty-sixth, or nineteen ninety, to uh, to come to terms with this one-to-one -one, uh, conversion rate. So it was not, well, one could be reminded of Shakespeare, and so uh, even if it's insane, there was method in it. And uh, so the method, to, to, or to, to, to analyze the method, is, is what is certainly the task of, uh, well, scholars like these two gentlemen here on this panel. Let me address a final uh, point. I mentioned the um, uh, the uh, uh, well, the role of legends and and myth. What was uh, at the root? What was the root cause, if there was any, of the behavior of East Germans uh, calling for something which, uh, well, reasonably could only lead to the destruction of the economic basis of their own living. That had to do, uh, indeed, it seems to me, and you can read it in, in, in Jonathan Zetland's uh, book, The Currency of Socialism, very nice title, very telling title. Uh, it was uh, the idea that money is not necessarily connected to the real economy, uh, which, of course, is not true. But uh, having had the experience over, well, at that point in time for at least 15 years that the D-mark was something you have or you have not. And once you have it, you may walk into the intershop and buy, buy all those things you otherwise not only cannot afford, but uh, you, you, it, it just, uh, that are just out of reach. That was, uh, must have led, had a deep imprint on the uh, psyche of East Germans uh, for whom the D-Mark was not an economic thing. It was the symbol of modest prosperity and, well, uh, being uh, slightly better off than the neighbor next door. And that created the myth of the D-Mark and the illusion that, well, a conversion rate of one to one was something which had this immediate positive effect of being able to walk over the still existing official border to West Berlin or to Thüringen or to, to, to Hessen or to, to North Bavaria, going into the shops and, and buying all those uh, nice uh, things. I, I remember, for example, that in those dramatic weeks back in 1990, I was, I was wondering why all these East Germans are, are uh, on leave. They, they, they were uh, driving to Spain and to Italy during those very dramatic weeks we have heard being described here on, by, by, by our panel as well. The reason is very, it's, it's very understandable and we should shy away from any arrogance in this, this context. Well, put yourself in the shoes of, 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 of people who had not that possibility to, to uh, go to Spain or to Italy, to New Paris only by name, for <coughs> example. So, and then in a the situation they had dissolved their their saving accounts, they had converted 
uh, there are 10,000 uh, DDR mark into 10,000 um, uh, Deutsche mark. They bought a used car, a nice used car, West German brand, of course, and then drove to Italy. French brand. Uh, maybe, maybe. I do not know. As I said in the beginning, I do not know exactly. But uh, that's my hint and my personal recollection. So that was the situation in the summer of 1990. And uh, the uh, perception, or what Irving Collier called the misperception of economic reality, uh, was not restricted to the summer of or early, uh, the early uh, period of the first half of 1990. It somehow continued, and we are still paying a price for that, I guess. And if you think of the actual, of the, of the, of the, of the present uh, situation in Germany, the, uh, the our changing party system and the surprising rise of a party uh, whose economic philosophy is tightly connected to that kind of illusions, you see what legacy in history, especially in economic history, may mean. Thank you. Thank you very much. We only have 15 or 20 minutes for questions, so I'm going to ask the panelists not to respond immediately. Instead, gather a couple of questions, and then they can talk. A question for Mr. Zagdin. He described very well how, um, how the monetary union rever reverberated and it sent its shockwave to the ERM and caused all the hassle in the European community. In, in, your, opinion, in, in your opinion, do you think that it was this event that also triggered the resentment in the United Kingdom about the, the disappearance of the ERM and that triggered uh, possibly a Euro skepticism there? One more question. Just a couple of quick, uh, questions. One, we haven't heard too much about the role of the Troyhand in the uh, in the economic fate of the East, and I wonder if maybe one or both of the economic historians or the great expert mm. in the Troyhand might might care to comment on that. And another thing that I, I I just wonder if you could comment a little bit on why it was that. Uh, uh, productivity was so much less in East Germany than West. I mean, productivity, as I understand it, does not necessarily uh, fall in, does not necessarily refer really to the willingness to work necessarily, the willingness to work of, of labor. It's, it, it's, it's a particular product per labor hour, and uh, as I understand it, and um, uh, that can also uh, uh, come as a result of uh, of inadequate equipment, inadequate, organiz inadequate organization, and so on. So just as a historical matter, I, it would be interesting to know exactly why productivity was so much lower in the East than the West. Uh, I have just one. Oh, we can start? Okay. Um, let's, um, why don't I go backwards? So uh, lower productivity. Um, I would argue that it's fixed capital. Uh, if you take a look, if you just look at internal GDR statistics, uh, maybe not take them entirely seriously, but look at them as a, a, a question of trends. Although I think in this particular, the, the age of capital equipment, um, they are relatively trustworthy, the statistics. What you see is that a lot of the, the capital in the GDR is actually from the last period of the Third Reich. So a lot of it was really old. There is a, a wave of new investment in the 1950s through the early 60s, and again, a smaller wave after, let's say, 64, 65. Um, but by the time you get to the 1980s, what you've seen is that Honecker, the second uh, leader of the, the GDR, had been investing, actually, uh, in placating the population by throwing Levi's and all sorts of other consumer goods at the population rather than investing in fixed capital. There are major exceptions to that. And an example would be, for example, uh, Volkswagen. He negotiated with Volkswagen to get a, a huge assembly line uh, to basically modernize the Trabant. Uh, but it, what he bought was, was a, basically a used piece of garbage at a very high price. Um, Falvey sold him a bill of goods. And uh, this, is, this is some of the story. This is a really big problem, because by the time you get to the 1980s, I think most people in East Germany understood that a lot of the work they were doing there, not just produ production bottlenecks because of a lack of factor inputs, uh, but also because the machines are breaking down. And the regime even goes over to importing Vietnamese laborers 
to do manual, to do the things that machines are supposed to do. So you have a, a process, if you like, of deindustrialization that not just the GDR, but Poland, uh, Romania to some extent, a lot of these countries were, were caught up in. So I think that's actually the key. There are other factors. Um, I will, I'll let uh, um, Wolfgang talk about the, the toy hunt just briefly about, um, I mean, the, I'm not a, an expert on, on Britain, but from what I do know, of course, Euroscepticism has been there for quite some time, has a lot to do on the one hand with decolonization, on the other hand, the um, successive attempts of the French uh, governments to keep, uh, either keep the, the, the uh, British out of the European community at some level, or make them join it on really bad terms. So there's, there's, I think, all sorts of resentments and and problems in the relationships. Perhaps, um, you know, Thatcher um, demanding that the uh, um, that Britain be paid back essentially uh, in the transfer system. I mean, these things don't help. But I do think you're absolutely right. I mean, Britain is the only country to leave the ERM and not rejoin. And I think that is significant. Uh, I think at the same time, Thatcher. Um, for all of her economic understanding, really blew this. They joined at the wrong time, during a sharp contraction. At, at, and it seems like this is a pattern going back to the 1950s. Every time the British try and get involved in any kind of European economic or in particular monetary moment, they join too late so that the terms are horrible. And they pay a huge price. And in this particular instance, they decided not to rejoin. Whether or not they do join the euro at some point, I mean, I think this is going to have to, we're going to have to see how the current downturn plays out for the euro land. Um, but I, I wonder at some point whether or not they won't have to. I'd like to differentiate uh, between <coughs> two different phases. The first phase, the hot phase, when history was going by like a freight train. Uh, and, you know, it was really hard to jump onto that a freight train that was going by, and uh, kind of now to completely uh, 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 switch metaphors, the population, that fear of the population making German unification occur in West Germany, that was the disciplining mechanism. Uh, and I just look at this bit of history almost like you have a flock of geese that flies into a jet plane, okay? And then you find out there's one or two people who have to make the decision of how to put that plane down. Now, when someone puts the plane down and everybody survives, this is brilliant. But we're talking about half of the people, you could say half of East German industry, got wiped out when this thing came down. And so, the, you know, I think we have the, this morning we talked about what and why. Um, and then the social scientist in me that is in, in most economists that I know, what difference did it make is uh, kind of the question that you have to say. It's not enough after you run over your kid's bicycle backing up to simply say, I didn't see the bike. Well, of course you didn't see the bike. You know, nobody deliberately drives over a bike. No one deliberately uh, uh, destroys the economy. This idea of saying, what were the alternatives scenarios, these counterfactual histories, I don't th think this is a question of idle academic uh, 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 debate. This is very much, you know, uh, answering the question. That's how we know whether or not the question is important, if it made a difference for good or for bad. Uh, but how do we know if it makes a difference for good or bad? We only observe the one playing of history. Um, that's why this kind of speculation, a, a lot of what I think went wrong was there was a lot of conventional thinking inside the box. For that first phase, it's easy to understand. Things were happening fast. You had to make decisions and you know, make the decisions and clean up afterwards. In, in the drawing that I had, where we were looking at what was happening in the middle of the 90s, the magic went away. The euphoria that was driving a lot of investors towards uh, the new states was lost. What scared away the animal spirits? And here my argument is this was not something that was rushed. What we had was the Delore report that basically had a time plan set out for the introduction of the European Monetary Union. This was written, it was agreed to more or less, before the Hungarians even started cutting barbed wire. And so you get this example of the enormous inertia in public policy. People agreed this is the plan, this is how things are going to go. We're in 1994. They agree 
to bring in, you know, with 1997 uh, is the next, when the, uh, the next stage uh, is going to be introduced. But there was a systematic tightening. They had plenty of time to think about what were German interests. I understand there was not a whole lot of room, wiggle room uh, in that hot phase. But during the mid-90s, um, I would have expected enough people would have thought about what are the consequences when you have an economic shock of the order of absorbing the, the, the new states of Germany. Uh, you need uh, an independent monetary policy, independent uh, fiscal policy, you need independent labor market policies, you probably have to differentiate your labor market policies between East and West. All of these things actually were on the other side of what people could imagine, but the fact that we can talk about them means it is possible to imagine them. And I think, you know, the historical question is going to be, uh, you know, why was there so little doubt at the time that the Delors plan was such a good plan, and I think it has everything to do with, you know, all of the things people uh, uh, learn to live with. This idea of having uh, a stronger Europe was good for Germany in a divided Cold War. That's why you wanted a strong Western Europe. Those conditions were gone. Germany had an incredible shock that there would have been a balancing about German interests that would have said, not abandon the European project, but people time out. We have to get our uh, uh, house in order. Uh, you're not going to be better off if we're uh, uh, a, uh, the, uh, a giant economic power in uh, 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 Europe that's crippled. So I, I, my, my focus, I, I think, is much more on the mistakes made in the middle part of the 1990s rather than uh, uh, nitpicking about uh, uh, quick decisions made under a lot of stress. Speaking of which, did you want to respond to the question about the toy hand? Yeah, okay. I, I, I could this uh, do for hours, of course, but I uh, Within uh, about two or will three have to do it in, 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 a, in brutal <laughs> <Yes>. brevity. <laughs> and I, well, I also could, uh, it's, it's all in my book, of course. But uh, <laughs> the thing is, um, uh, at that time, we were basically talking about uh, the, the toy hand anstalt played uh, one role and one Role only. That was the the, the period uh, until June, uh, July the first, before the currency union. It was kind of a, a giant war firm. It was its main task was was to to transform the former VEBs, Volkseigene Betriebe and Kombinate, into a Gesellschaft mit beschränkter Haftung and Aktiengesellschaften. So it was it, it was it was a, an organization of some. 120 people at that time in the well, first half of, of 1990. It was founded actually uh, under, under the Modro uh, government, March the 1st, uh, 1990. And, and it was uh, his, it, the, the task at that time was to keep the hand of the government on the uh, state owned assets, uh, the, the industrial assets in, in particular, in order to do a reasonable thing again, which was to prevent it from just being sold out and uh, to, to, to lose control over what was the only asset, only, uh, well, uh, what is the word, the cor corollary uh, for the uh, expected uh, indebtedness of uh, both the East German and the West German government. Uh, so the, 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 the counter value, so, so, so to speak, and that was the basic idea, and the idea was, was, was quite good. So it, it changed dramatically, absolutely substantially, with the currency union, because then uh, the Torrent Anschluss immediately was the owner, the formal owner, uh, responsible for a conglomerate of some 8,000 firms that were not profitable, that were uh, making heavy losses every hour. And imagine or put yourself in the shoes of the guy at, at the top of that institution. So that was the situation uh, in the logical second when the two currencies were, were switched. And uh, so then it became uh, this uh, kind of institution that were, was perceived by many East Germans uh, German, until today as this uh, kind of brutal uh, executor of the will of the Western uh, capitalist class or something like that. So, but that was just the consequence of the very decisions we have been talking about 
the previous minutes. We have time for one more question. Uh, uh, my question is this. The rest of the member states or uh, countries around y'all, their economies were not as strong as the collective German economies. How was that affecting the value of the German currency and was there any pressure on Germany at the time uh, to uh, do anything realizing that it was so strong compared to the surrounding countries and, and the effect it would have on the whole house of cards at that time of the former Eastern Europe. It, it sounds to me like you're asking two different questions. One would be capital flows into West Germany anticipating a currency union. And the second would be the connection between a foreign direct investment in, in Germany versus foreign direct investment in Czechoslovakia. In places like that? I guess what I'm asking is, were the actions of, of the German group, the two, did they have to take into account the surrounding countries around them in, in, in their movements? Because if there was instability on their, from their neighbors, would it spill over in, into Germany or vice versa? Well, I'm not a specialist on um, foreign relations much less a political scientist. So, I, I mean, I don't feel comfortable answering that question. But I can tell you that economically, uh, the, the Bundesbank in particular was really concerned about, for a while at any rate, uh, the way in which the mark was, was actually appreciating in value. People thought at first that it would depreciate in value. But actually, there were a lot of people who were looking to make money off of uh, the kinds of changes they anticipated happening. It wasn't until coal... Uh, three different ways that Kohl um, basically snubbed the Bundesbank that the mark actually be did begin to fall and that the long bonds in particular um, start to go, the yields went up. And so the Bundesbank was the institution that took control of that and was extremely aggressive, uh, partly because it felt that it had lost credibility and partly because it really was concerned about all of the implications of the conversion rate and uh, all of the other things that the coal government was doing. So it was incredibly aggressive. One of the things that Wolfgang had mentioned is that, you know, the, at the moment that you have a currency union you, and you price these firms out of business, um, that's the moment at which, for example, even West German firms like VW decide that it's much more interesting to invest in the Czech and Slovak uh, uh, car industry than it is to invest in the Trabant and the Wartburg. Why bother? It, this is not only a, not a good car, it was a terrible, both of them were terrible cars, uh, but the labor costs are, are incredible. And at least the Czechs and the Slovaks, because they're still together, have a very cheap currency. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of wonderful... So what happens is this sort of um, side effect of, of um, currency union is that it really does make East Germany part of the West uh, at least in this currency sense, without allowing it to undergo a, a period of, of um, foreign direct investment and development, it just continues to deindustrialize because foreign investors are, are swarming into Poland and, in particular, the Czech and Slovak republics. Uh, You're answering my question. Okay. Um, okay, one last uh, short if question. If I may, I want to address another aspect. Uh, it was the labor policy was briefly mentioned and in, in the East, there was no unemployment. It was an overemployment right. that, of course, had the effect on the productivity. Yeah. And after unification, the West German unions took the contracts of the West to the East. So the unit cost immediately got through the roof, which again pushed the productivity down. So we should never forget uh, the negative impact of the unions in this transition process. I, to be really frank, I, I have a hard problem with this argument. Um, if I could just, just very quickly. The, I, that's absolutely correct. But everybody, economists, professional economists who had no relationship to policy as well as policy advisors, as well as the government, uh, everyone knew this was going to happen. So it, it, it wasn't a secret, and in fact, if you're a union, this is precisely following your interests. So it's really hard to pin this on the unions. This was going to happen one way or the other. The trade-off, it seems to me, is that either you stop the labor exodus by giving the East Germans a high conversion rate, but you stop it and you make possible German unification, and then you deindustrialize at a rapid pace in awful terms, or, in other words, you get what I was calling formal political union without any social or economic union, or 
you make sure that there is a gradual convergence that saves people's jobs, but maybe you, you don't stabilize things because there's still the possibility there'll be an out-migration and you, you endanger the possibility of unification. I mean, I think that's the trade-off. And that's why I agree with, with uh, Wolfgang. I'm not trying to say that coal is insane at all. I just think it has very specific consequences, both for Germany and for Europe. Uh, Professor Collier has one minute. Okay, I'm going to jump in and say, being frank, uh, I think the, the West German unions played an awful role in that first year. Uh, that everybody, There was so much blame to go around, everyone was right, pointing the finger at everybody else. I mean, this is also what makes it very productive. Everyone's saying the right thing. Uh, the consequence of that was, in fact, uh, the destruction of one of the princi core uh, uh, principles of German collective bargaining, which is this common agreed cartel set wage across the industry, across all sorts of circumstances. East German firms do not participate now in the, on the employer side. So the, actually the uh, West German unions, uh, in part following what they believed from before, and in part protecting their own naked interest, managed to uh, put permanent damage in one of the core principles they believe in as far as having the one collectively uh, uh, bargained wage uh, across the board for everybody. And Professor Zeibel demands one minute. You, uh, I, yeah, it's nicely expressed, yeah, no, it, it, but uh, because it's, it, it somehow comes from the bottom of my heart, what, I, what I'm saying, uh, in the sense that, well, uh, you both are absolutely right in positive terms. So the unions did that wage policy they did, and that was heavily detrimental to the economic situation in East Germany, no doubt about that. But refrain from union bashing, because they had a different role to play as well. Remember the situation in early 99, 1991, when the first massive layoffs occurred. So they were in the situation, the unions, with the West German leadership to demonstrate that they were able to organize labor and to mitigate conflicts as well as to organize well, labor for the sake of more of, of wage increases. So that was their crucial political role. And if you remember the situation in March and April 91, it was the day or the day occurred when Rohwerder was shot. And it was an inkling of what could happen in terms of violence in a situation when you have that kind of layoffs, that region and entire Germany, by the way, never had experienced before. So that role, the stabilizing role of the unions also had its price. Thank you very much and we'll reconvene at 3.30.